All right, folks, I think we will go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to our first training workshop for the Bighorn Basin Barracks Count. Um, this is a very exciting project that we're embarking on, uh, on a quest to try and identify and document and uh, get the condition of all of the Heart Mountain Barracks that are still here in Park County. And uh, eventually we hope to explore beyond that. Um, this uh, project is uh, partially funded through a grant uh, from uh, the Wyoming State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, and so we thank them and also, of course, the Park County Historic Preservation Commission, who has partnered with us for this program here. I want to direct all of you, you attendees down toward the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen right there, if you hover down there. You can feel free to submit your questions that you might have for our panelists here. Um, and uh, we've got quite a slate of uh, uh, well-educated uh, folks um, who are going to tell you a little bit about the history of the barracks and uh, then we'll go into a little bit about identifying them and documenting them as well. Uh, I'll introduce them as they come in. But uh, first off, I thought for a little bit of history of the story of the barracks, and the story of the camp itself, uh, it would be good to get someone who was actually here. And so I've brought in one of our members from the uh, Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation Board of Directors, uh, Prentiss Uchida, to talk a little bit about his life in the barracks and his life inside of the camps there. And so Prentiss, let me pass things on over to you. Okay, thanks Dakota. Uh, first off, I guess probably most of you know, but what and why the barracks? Well, on December 7, 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, fear motivated most of what's happened next. And in 1942, Executive Order 9066, allowing incarceration of anybody of Japanese descent happened. Thus, uh, 120,000 Japanese, two thirds of who were American citizens, were incarcerated. 10 concentration camps were put together, including Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Uh, thus the barracks were hastily erected. Barracks were constructed of uh, green pines siding with uh, tar paper covering on the outside. Thus the siding over time shrunk, leaving um, large gaps in the, between the siding. Uh, personally, myself and my family, I actually only was um, turned one years old at that time. Uh, we moved to Heart Mountain and at the time suffered the coldest winter in history. It was, uh, I think, minus 18 degrees in 1943. Uh, I don't remember a whole lot over that period of time, but uh, I do remember we had a pot belly stove, uh, one light bulb hanging from the ceiling, no running water. Uh, we had common toilets for the entire block, a mess hall for the entire block. And these were not close. They were like 100 feet or more away from the toilets. And um, uh, these were not temporary facilities. These were the permanent facilities for almost four years. So if you think about it, that, um, uh, well, okay, you had toilets, et cetera. But think about it in the middle of the night if you had to go up and get out and go to the bathroom. And it was 18, minus 18 degrees outside, snow, et cetera. So, uh, what we had were, we called gettas, and these were um, uh, like flip-flops, but on stilts, such that you could hover among, above the mud and the snow. Um, I lived in, um, uh, with my mother in block 11F, and that was probably the furthest reach of the camp. And um, this picture you see be behind me is a recent picture I took last year um, from block two. And this is from between block one and block two. So this is very close to where I lived. And these fence posts that you see were the original fence posts uh, that were at the time uh, of the camps. Um, basically the, the walls were, as I remember of, um, uh, the walls were of newspapers, meaning there were old newspapers actually, mother covered the inside of the walls with old newspapers. Um, and we had um, uh, 
uh, remember this, what we call a chamba. Chamba is a chamber pot. Uh, of course, we didn't have a decent chamber pot, so we used old coffee cans. And this was avoiding going to the bathroom in the middle of the night in inclement weather, basically. Uh, I could also remember something like old Sears catalogs as, as toilet paper. And um, like I said, these were not temporary situations. This thing lasted for four years this way. So my boyhood experience really was um, that I remember the most was really of uh, looking out the window and lightning and thunder. And I was very much afraid of the thunder, didn't mind the lightning so much. But uh, at the time we had to explain that, okay, they kind of went together and uh, for the first time learned the, uh, the physics of the fact that uh, sound travels uh, slower than light, et cetera. And so that was my first experience of that. But the biggest experience I had was on Christmas. You know, we were Buddhists and a Buddhist really never celebrated Christmas. But uh, in camp was my first experience of Christmas and uh, so I was taught about Santa Claus. And um, so he came to camp and, uh, and he gave presents to, uh, to each of the children that, uh, uh, that, um, that, were at the, that were at the, in my block basically. And, um, and I was given a doll. So uh, I was quite disappointed and uh, had my mother go back and say, you know, Santa Claus made a mistake and, you know, why did I get a doll? And, um, but to my chagrin, um, nothing, <laughs> nothing changed. So I had to live with the doll that I got for that Christmas. And, and to me, here is Santa Claus, which to me was, and, and this was like, I mean, I had no uh, definition of God or nobody explained God to me, but they did explain Santa Claus who was omniscient, right? So he knew who was naughty, he knew who was nice, he knew who was uh, good or bad, and he knew who was awake or asleep, but obviously he didn't know who was a boy and a girl. <laughs> so that was uh, 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 devastating for me for quite a long time, I think. The, the other thing that I remember was uh, that just before we're leaving camp that uh, 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 we, I went to nursery school and that was something that was, I went to by myself and it was away from the barracks that I lived in. Uh, I lived in 11F, as I said, and my mother actually drilled that in me because of the fact that uh, um, she didn't want me to get lost. And so, but in nursery school, yeah, that was a journey all on my own that I went to school by myself and got home by myself. and. Uh, the thing that I learned there that I remember was I learned how to tie my shoelaces, but I only used one loop. So I didn't learn how to do the second loop until later on in life. But uh, so leaving camp in 1945, we went back to San Jose, California and the conditions were actually worse than camp. There was a small shack, no running water, same newspaper as wallpaper and uh, a um, shared outhouse with the other families in the area and a shared bathhouse. So, you know, they say that um, the greatest growth for a human being is in the first five years of life. Um, since I was four years old when I left camp, that was um, not only my camp experience, but it was my Welcome to the world experience. Uh, and uh, I now realize after investigation that this really had a great effect on, on the rest of my life. So that's my uh, short camp experience. Thank you. Chris, would you mind walking us through some of these photos that you shared with us? Oh, yeah, this is, um, this is uh, actually very close to where the, the, the uh, image in my background is. And this is outside of uh, block one. I think here, the block one, the first building you see on the right-hand side is probably the outermost building on the southwest uh, corner of the camp. And um, the one thing I remember, I thought that the 1F was really on the 
left side of the building, but apparently I was corrected. It's on the right side of the building, but in my head, it was always on the uh, it was on the left side of the building, but I guess it's on the right. And the second photo was actually in front of um, the alcove of that building. So you see in the first photo, the thing sticking out of the building over there. Uh, and in this on the right photo is that porch that's sticking out. And that alcove went into uh, two sides of the building, meaning that uh, on the right was F and on the left was E. Okay, this on the left here is my uncle Henry, and he was a cook. And so this was, I believe, the mess hall. And it shows the hours of the mess hall here on, uh, uh, on the meal hours. And oh, I guess they got a different thing for Sunday. So he was a cook there. On the right, again, was uh, myself, the taller one, and I think the next door neighbor kid, if I remember. I don't remember his name or anything, but this was obviously in the time of snow and it's in that same porch. And the, uh, like I said, I guess the, um, uh, the, the right side of that, uh, the porch or the right side of that building was where I lived. Either that or that was my, in front of my grandmother's place and she lived in E, so that would have been if you went up the stairs on the left side. And um, so I can't, I can't remember, there's an army truck in the back there and another barrack back there, but I can't, so I can't ex exactly place where this is. Okay, here's um, again on the porch here. And uh, we had a four step porch. And uh, if you look right now at the, uh, uh, at Hart Mountain where the barrack we have, there is really a three, three stepper. And I think I questioned that. And apparently it is basically uh, just how much um, elevation it is to get to the ground, I guess. And so there were three steps, four steps, maybe there were more, I don't know. But this was, I'm, I'm the kid on the left-hand side and that's my grandmother and I think two neighbor kids. And I believe this was like my grandmother doing daycare because uh, the parents were working either at the mess hall or something like that. My mother actually worked at the mess hall. Uh, there's my uncle Henry again and his family or his wife. And the other three people, I'm not sure who they are, to be honest with you. But you'll notice there that uh, on his barrack, he has his name up in the, uh, on the right side of the door above the lady's head and it's H. Kurosaki. And I guess people did that. And, um, uh, and according to Dakota here, I guess someone collected all these nameplates and uh, so they exist someplace. Um, and you'll also see here that the laundry is outside. Uh, it's not, um, and there's a bunch of junk laying around on the bottom here, but this is a common barrack scene, I guess. Ah, okay. <laughs> On the right here is my Uncle Henry again, and this is in front of the now famous smokestack that uh, from the boiler room that's still there. So he's in the snow and I guess he took a picture there because of the fact I guess it's picturesque. The, on the left side is uh, my Uncle George and his wife. And uh, the reason I showed this picture is that all the barracks are in the background there. So you can see, and I think this was at the old swimming hole that during the winter was iced over and so a skating hole, I guess if you want to call it. And my uncle George there is uh, relatively famous now for being the trombone player in the Georgie Gall Orchestra. You know, I didn't know this until I went to um, uh, Aaron Aoyama and uh, Julian Saparidi's talk. And I saw a picture there of the orchestra and I said, God, I recognize somebody in there. And so I went up and had him show the picture and it was my Uncle George and he was the trombone player in there. Also had a cousin uh, that was 16 that was a sax player in that band. And I didn't know that either, but uh, um, Uncle George here was a resistor and uh, later on went to, uh, was in a trial in, in, uh, in a famous trial in Wyoming and ended up in McNeil Island prison basically, and got out in 1946.
Okay, this is yours here, Dakota. Thank you, Prentice. I okay. just brought up that last one because that was uh, um, that was a, a drawing of block one, so you can kind of see. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. I'll put it up again. Put it yeah, up again. Sure. Absolutely. This is by the artist Joe Nakanishi. Yeah. Who lived right across the way from you, over in the end of twenty four there. Okay, so you see here on the lower left hand corner is one. That's where I lived, and so. This fence line uh, goes along the outside or the left hand side of this drawing, one, two, three, four, five, six, the fire break and off to 12. And so it's up uh, above 12 because that's the break between one and two. So that's this photo that uh, you're seeing behind me is where this starts. And so, and, and like I said, those fence posts are still in there. And in one, I believe, I guess, I guess one one F is the left, further, you know, the left uh, south uh, west corner is, is is where I live. But in my head, in my memory, it was always uh, the uh, the right side, of the, the other side of the building, basically, which was the A side of the building, I guess. But um, and you'll notice here also how far the toilets are. And if you can imagine in the middle of the night having to go take a pee in minus 18 degrees in Wyoming, that's a long trek. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, wasn't pleasant, I guess. And that's the reason- We're mentioning, Prentice, that this half block that we, we see down at the bottom here um, that shares this mess hall and this toilet, you have about 250 people living in that half block. Oh, wow, well, geez, okay. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so I guess we all got up at the same time, you had a lot of company. <laughs> but anyway, no, my, my mother and her infinite wisdom, wisdom had this chamba or, uh, you know, essentially what it was, was a old coffee can that uh, I was allowed to use so I didn't have to go weather the storm out there as a four-year-old. <laughs> All right, and this uh, this drawing I think is great because it gives us an idea of, of the buildings too that were on each block right there. Um, okay, yeah, okay, this, now this comes to memory. Okay, see these recreation halls there? I think that's where the nursery school was, okay? And so I had, I learned at a, as a four-year-old going from the lower left-hand corner of one all the way over to the, um, the recreation hall, which was the nursery school going back and forth. So that was my journey. And so that was um, embedded in me how to make that, how to make that journey basically as a four-year-old. So, um, so anyway, that, that's interesting that yeah, you, you have the rec hall there because I think that's where the nursery school was. And it's always interesting to me, Prentice, we were talking about this the other day that this camp, you got to remember there are, you know, uh, 18 other blocks that look just like this, right? right. That, that are identically laid out. And so you got to imagine your parents were really drilling into you how to get around just because all of these barracks were identical, right? Right, right. No, that's true. That's true. But you know, I don't, uh, for the, I, I don't remember using the toilets. I, I, for some reason, I must have used them, but I just don't have any recollection of that at all. Yeah. Do you maybe remember I, the mess halls? At think, all? Uh, what's that? Do you remember the mess halls at all? Not so much. No. Only the only the Christmas program with the omniscient Santa Claus. <laughs> I couldn't tell the difference between boys and girls, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> Well, thanks, Prentice, and I may bring you back in later. Um, okay, for those of you who are joining us a little bit late here, there is a Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen there. And if you want to press that, then uh, you can ask Prentice any questions that you have, and we'll bring him back up later to answer some of those. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to move you off, Prentice, and I'm going to yep. bring up uh, Eric Sandine. 
who uh, has been on the trail of these barracks uh, for quite a while now as uh, part of um, the University of Wyoming American Studies program. He's been a professor with the program for a long, long time, uh, now Professor Emeritus. And uh, he uh, has been following the story of what has hap what happened to these barracks after they left the camp uh, for a long while. And so, Eric, I'm just going to pass things over to you, and I'll bring up your slides here momentarily. Okay, then. Um, I was going to start off with uh, a kind of a, a, a couple of remarks about frames that we might think of. But before we do that, let me let me just say that. Um, you mentioned that 200 people were in, in every half block. Uh, I think you could make the case that because it was in Wyoming for such a long time during the duration of the war, um, that this might have been the first truly urban environment in the history of Wyoming, <laughs> uh, more than just a, a temporary camp, but something where there was enough density and enough activity going on of all different kinds that formed a, a, a functioning community. So that this was really Wyoming's first urban environment. And of course, a lot of the incarcerees came, had urban experiences. So um, living in close proximity uh, <laughs> under different circumstances, admittedly, um, was more uh, part of their lifestyle than a part of folks in Wyoming. Um, but what I wanted to point out with was um, you, that you have to keep in mind, and I know the Wyoming people who are listening to this, um, that this was uh, a, uh, a Bureau of Reclamation project that was used for settlement during World War II because the federal government had could have control over it. So after the war, it became what it was always intended to be, namely a homestead project. Um, and um, so that differentiates Heart Mountain from some of the other, um, what, what were called at the time, relocation centers, um, that this was an existing project of the Bureau of Reclamation. The other thing is quite obvious, namely that the buildings were put up in a big hurry uh, and were, were made to be temporary. Um, if you can go to the slide, maybe I'll be able to, that one, yeah. Um, so they were put up, at, it was said in 59 minutes, um, and you can see work crews that are going from barrack to barrack, constructing buildings that were identical, that were 120 feet long, 20 feet wide. Um, and, um, if you look at this, both in the way that they were constructed and the, the kind of the general layout that they have, um, they look kind of Levittown-like. I mean, there's a kind of suburban mass production quality to them that you'll see in a vastly different context after the war. But keep in mind that kind of suburban context for this. Uh, next slide. Oh, that's your slide. That's another one of yours. Oh, uh, here we go. And so, well, I, I'm not talking, although I could talk at length about what brought these people who stayed in Wyoming um, and what compelled them to stay there. Let's just talk about what they did while they were there. Um, and a lot of it centered around agriculture. They dug a major canal. Um, they opened up the area for farming and it became very productive. Now this is important because that's exactly what happens in a different context after the war with the homesteaders. So the, the common bond between the Japanese Americans and, and the homesteaders centers around land and water and involves farming. And what you get over the course of years, and this is important for those of you who are going to be barrack uh, detectives, you get this massive landscape transformation so that what the Japanese Americans confronted when they came in 1942 or whenever during the war was, okay, the climate was the same, the wind, God knows, is always the same in Wyoming, but the surrounding area was not, did not look the same as it looks now that it's been in production for so many years. Next slide. 
So now I'm, I'm just going to skip to the end of the war. And um, when the camp became a resource for homesteaders, rather than a place where people were incarcerated, uh, the barracks were valuable commodities because uh, building supplies were in short, short supply. And if you were successful in getting a homestead, uh, barracks, which could be sold to you for a dollar a piece, were the building blocks, not just for your house, but also for your outbuildings. So um, if you go to the Homesteader Museum, for example, in, in Powell, uh, what you'll see is, is a bunch of photographs organized mostly by families that show how uh, the logistics of that works. Like, for example, you'd have to saw your building in half or maybe in thirds. Uh, somebody I met said, oh yeah, we could do that in an hour. Well, maybe you could do that in an hour. I sure couldn't, but here it is being done. Uh, the center photograph shows you a contemporary barrack, a reasonably contemporary barrack that had been abandoned, um, probably gone by now, but you can see clearly how it was uh, separated and then sort of patched back together again. And then in the bottom right, you see them moving uh, portions of barracks from the former camp, which is in the background, to uh, to wherever your homestead was. So this is the beginning of your, your life in uh, the Bighorn Basin. Next slide. There it is. It's kind of, um, it's, it's dramatic in, in its way to see a building on wheels uh, in the late 40s, particularly when it's still open-ended. You can see the windows, you can see the holes where the, the chimneys would have been. Um, it's on the move. Next one. Um, and this is taken from one of the family albums at the, uh, at the Homesteader Museum, uh, the Bright family. Um, and I think it's really good because it, it shows how um, these buildings are sort of the foundation for the dream. This is the homesteaders' dream of settlement, and, and you can see them um, inscribing it before we closed it in, 1950, standing in the opening. Go ahead. So there were, there were actual uh, plans that were distributed by, um, the, by the Bureau of Reclamation on how to put these segments of um, barracks together. And I think this is the most popular one, a kind of L-shaped house. And so here you can see it uh, being attached. Next slide. And here we have uh, happy inhabitants of something that, that you know, kind of looks familiar from a suburb or any place where 800 square feet or so would get you a house. Next slide. And so today, even though this has been added on to a couple of times and, and encased in stucco and um, the windows have been changed out and probably the doors in a different place, uh, the shape of this and the dimensions uh, indicate that this is, in fact, a barrack, which it is. Next slide. So there's this kind of transitional period where, when um, people had received their uh, allotments, their homesteads, but uh, hadn't had a chance to do much with that homestead yet. And so this is a kind of 20th century version of any number of 19th century paintings and photographs about you know, staking a claim and going out to till the land or maybe just yank the sagebrush first. Go ahead. Uh, and then of course, the importance of water is everywhere. Uh, it was important to the Japanese Americans who, who raised an incredible uh, quantity and variety of produce in Wyoming. It was astounding what they what they could do. Uh, several, many of them had been to uh, the agricultural school at Davis and had experience with truck farming and so they knew what they were doing in a very different climate admittedly, but they knew what they were doing. Uh, for the people who came as homesteaders, um, possibly less so. Some people were, were not experienced farmers. Um, 
some people were not ex experienced in an area of the country where you actually had to apply water to plants in order for them to grow. Um, so you're looking at um, hopeful struggle here and the, uh, uh, the application of water to land to make that transformation that you see out in, in, in the basin today. Um, it's, it's quite extraordinary. And there's a lot of oral history of the people who uh, came to the area through the homesteads in the late 40s and early 50s and how tough it was and how much they relied on each other and on their ability to, to get the water to the land and start to work it. Um, next slide. So out in, the, out in the basin today, there are buildings that look like barracks. This is a lambing shed, but um, after you get done with this, uh, uh, this workshop, uh, you'll be able to identify this clearly as a barrack. Um, okay, next slide. Um, sometimes you have to go inside the building to figure out if it's a barrack. Uh, this is the, uh, the chimney that would have been shared by two different units inside the barrack. And so, as Prentice said, there was a pot-bellied stove and each unit would have one and it was connected to a common uh, chimney. So there'd be three chimneys per, per barrack uh, to service the six different apartments or rooms inside the barrack. And there, there you have a chimney that is still framed in uh, even though the outside of the building might not look anything like a barrack. Next. For example, this is a barrack. Um, it's thoroughly encrusted with this carapace of uh, uh, tin. Uh, if we got a little bit farther down, we could see that there's the remnant of a window that looks kind of familiar. And that gable end looks familiar too. If you really know what you're looking for, all you'd have to do is poke your head in the door uh, past that piece of equipment and you would see the remnants of a, uh, of a chimney and you would go, aha, I know what this is. So then you start documenting it because it is in fact a barrack. Is there another slide? Eric, I did want to break in here because I think this picture demonstrates something that my pictures don't necessarily that I have real well which is those rafter ends sticking out along the side edge right there, which is another dead giveaway of a barrack. Yep, you got it. And then even that light that's kind of projecting out in a different direction um, would have projected out through the center of the gable. And, and I, I think it's probably been relocated, but that, that's a whole nother thing. Is there another slide? Or am I at, at no, whoops. Oh, good. So here's some examples. You saw an example of a barrack, but they're all over the place. Some of them are in plain sight. Some of them are hiding under, what, six or seven decades worth of use. Um, a lot of people that we talked to really felt uh, very attached to their barrack and, 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 and very, it was very much a part of their own personal history. Um, some have retained parts of the barrack that were, that showed that there was a Japanese American inhabitation before them. Um, so there's, there's stuff that still could be collected that exists inside some of these sheds and outbuildings and even the houses. Um, and they're all over the place. So I'm hoping that we can, we can go out and find them because this is like the, the legacy of um, a very important period in our history that's, that's sitting out there still being used. Um, and I think that's about all I have to say, except that it kind of comes full circle. They were constructed as temporary buildings in a very kind of levittown suburban mode. Um, and many of them are in fact suburban buildings out there. <laughs> Uh, still inhabited. It, it, it's a really interesting history and I hope we can map them all. Absolutely and I'll probably pull you back up again toward the end as in case I miss anything on the ID that uh, you and Larry might be able to help out with. Um, but thanks Eric and sure. uh, 
Let's move on. And the next thing I want to talk about is a little more of the nuts and bolts of what we're asking you guys to do. Uh, so our hope is that we can identify as many barracks as possible. We know that there's plenty out there. Uh, Eric and his team from the University of Wyoming back in 2012 went out and uh, tried to ID as many as they could um, and developed a very nice exhibit with the Homestead Museum that we're hoping to get online within the next few weeks here to, to help you identify some of these too. Uh, but uh, as he mentioned in his presentation, there wind up being certain dead giveaways that the building you're, that you're looking at might be a barrack. And so I wanted to walk you guys through a few more photos of some barracks that are out there today uh, so that we could discuss um, what you might spot in there. Um, so first off, what I wanted to do is to give you guys a little sense of the actual layout of a barrack. And uh, this blueprint that I've got right here is actually a barrack that was used as a school, um, but actually the uh, layout that we're looking at the floor plan is identical what it, to what a residential barrack would have looked like within the camp there. So you can see the whole thing is 120 feet long by 20 feet wide. And so that becomes very important to you because if it is set out in the same way it was oriented in camp, that's an easy dead giveaway right there is just the dimensions. Uh, but even if it's been split into two pieces and turned into an L like Eric showed you or a T, or uh, there are buildings where, you know, barracks were added onto the ends of them right there. You can still use that 20 foot measurement and for the end, and that'll tell you pretty closely if it's a barrack or not. Um, you will see that this has six different units inside of it. I mentioned that uh, earlier when Prentice was talking that each block held about 500 people and each family or each barrack housed about six families inside of it. And so you'll see there are different sizes of rooms on the inside. You have the one on the end, the A and the F rooms, and those are uh, 16 by 20. Um, generally, uh, two to four people uh, will get assigned to a room of that size, so smaller families that you were looking at. A lot of times those were also used for uh, single people within camp that didn't have any family here. They'd get assigned roommates and put into a room like that. Uh, B next to it, or E, these are the largest rooms, 24 by 20. And so generally, if there are six or more people in the family, they would wind up going into a room of this size here. So these were the largest that they got is about 24 by 20. And then in the center, you've got uh, the C and D rooms, which are 20 by 20. So uh, sort of mid-sized rooms that you were looking at there assigned to mid-sized families within the camp. You can notice as Eric was talking about, the uh, the stoves that lead into the chimneys. Uh, there are is a pot belly stove in each unit, coal burning, that uh, they each share a chimney. So there's a red brick chimney that uh, these two share, and we can see a picture of that later. I'll pull one up. And also the vestibules that he was talking about. Every exterior door with the steps on the outside then leads into a small vestibule, which then opens up into two units that we're looking at right there. So that's a little sense of how barracks were laid out when they were in the camp there. I did want to point to you guys uh, some of the interior features that you might notice uh, when you're going out there. A lot of the barracks that are still around there still have the original doors to them right there. So if you look, you can see these five panel wooden doors. And sometimes you'll even see the strap hinges like this and the uh, interior and exterior hardware, I've got a picture of this on the other side, but the latch that you've got right there is something that you'll see a lot of. Another good giveaway of a barrack is that although when Japanese Americans first arrived here, uh, these were just bare wood walls on the inside, eventually the government did bring in Celotex into the camp, which is kind of this uh, 1940s wall board that you see right here. And eventually most of the units had Celotex put up on the inside right there on the ceiling and the walls both. And so if you can identify that uh, Celotex, it was pretty commonly in use uh, during that time, but if it, as well as other certain factors might indicate a barrack to you right there. We'll come back to that. I believe I have another picture of that right there. Uh, but just to give you a little indication of a, uh, 
another barrack uh, that is out there and show you what it looks like. Um, this one, I believe, and I think Ruth is out there, but tell me if I'm wrong, I believe this was Chester and Mary Blackburn's barrack uh, house that they had converted. So you can see this isn't a full length. It's not the full 120 feet. It looks about like a half barrack to me. Um, but you'll note that uh, also there's been a little uh, porch added off to the side right here as well. So you can see sort of where it's added onto, but the structure is overall the same. And you can kind of see if you're looking at the end of it uh, where it looks the same. Um, and here we have uh, Forrest Allen heading out to uh, his barrack that it has. Like the one that Eric showed you, this one is encased in tin. Uh, and so it can be hard to spot from the outside. And even those rafters are covered up by a board right along here. Um, but you will see certain features of it that are still intact right there. Uh, first off, that pole at the end, all of the barracks were connected to the electrical grid here in Iron Mountain uh, via these poles on the end. And so a lot of times those are still in place. You'll see them out there. And so this one's got that. And then, of course, you'll also note it's got those five panel doors along it right there. So there are certain features of this that when combined with the measurements will tell you uh, almost certainly that this is a barrack. And once you get to spotting that uh, slope of the roof, the way the roof peaks right there too, that's a real dead giveaway as well. Um, this one is out uh, along Highway 14A, just south of the Interpretive Center. This is uh, Russ Rock, this is Barrick. Um, he actually has several on his property that have been converted. Um, this one's a, a shop, but there's also a house there that is, it is, it is a barrack as well. But you can see this one's gone through quite a bit of change there. But if you look at it, you'll see how it's kind of sort of positioned together, right? And then uh, we've got uh, Tiny Collar's uh, barrack right there. And you can see that this one has had some additions made to it. It has... Uh, also been added on to over time. And so sometimes you've got to spot, spot pieces of buildings that might be barracks as well. And then of course, you're going to find some out there that are, have not been remodeled, that are in uh, pretty poor condition right there. And we'll get into these as we go into the assessment form here and talk about these and how to locate them and how to document them right there. But some of these might be falling down, even if that's the case, we wanna know it's there. It's better that, especially if we don't think that it is going to be a building that survives much longer, that we go ahead and get that documentation right now, get photos of it, get uh, a description of it, because you know, here in five, 10 years, that might be all we have left, which probably isn't true with some of these other buildings that I've been showing you right here. Uh, this one is uh, Takugawa's barrack, and I believe it is gone now. I, I think it fell all the way down. Uh, but you got to be ready to uh, look for some of these as well that, that uh, look uh, like they're on their last legs out there. Wanted to give you one more shot of the end of the barrack um, because it is so distinctive. If you look right here, you can see that pole that I was talking about. You probably recognize that from the other one with Forrest Allen right there. Another thing that I've noticed has not been covered up on a lot of these is they still have that vent up at the top right there. So if you see the vent or you see the pole over the vent, uh, that is a pretty good indication that you are looking at a barrack right there. Um, also, this is a good view of just the original exterior wall treatment for the barracks, is you have strips of tar paper that are run uh, usually vertically along here. And then those tar paper pieces are held in place with wooden battens. And so a lot of times you can still see on some of these uh, flecks of tar paper that have survived, or you can see uh, pieces of the wooden batten, even if the tar paper is gone, you'll still see bits of the batten uh, still on there. And so those are, are pretty dead giveaways as well right there. Um, You'll also see right over here in the corner, the only thing that they kind of had to mark what number of these barracks were, you'll see they had plates along the side uh, with their numbers on them. And some of the doors also have the letters on them as well. Although I'll say most of those are gone now. Um, I haven't spotted one that still has those there. Uh, this picture I wanted to bring up uh, because it shows uh, uh, the clotheslines that Prentice was talking about a little bit and the, the steps there. 
um, which could be a varying heights as he was pointing out. Uh, originally, these barracks were just set sort of on pillars as they were going on out here. And uh, eventually, the, um, for most of the time, the incarcerators themselves would pile up dirt around those pillars and bring it up to the level right there, because otherwise the wind would sweep in underneath of the barrack and uh, blow up through it there. So a lot of them eventually, if they were not at ground level, had dirt piled around them to bring them up to ground level there. But the other thing I wanted to point out within this picture in particular is these windows that you're looking at right here, this nine pane window uh, placed sort of evenly along here is another feature that you will still see, even if some of the windows are covered over, a lot of times you will see that uh, just like the doors, there are actually original windows uh, in these barracks as well. So it's something to look out for there. Mentioned that I was going to show you guys a couple of other features from a modern day one. This is a barrack that's out on uh, 2AB, uh, out northwest of Cody here. Um, so things to look for. This is what your Celatex might look like, especially if it's in a barrack that's been more or less abandoned. Um, you can see your Celatex wallboard in here. I'm actually looking in right now into one of the vestibules uh, and looking into, I'm inside of the vestibule looking into one of the units right there. And you'll also see the door that I was talking about. That's an original door that we've got right here. And you'll note the exterior of the hardware too, right here is just sort of a push latch on the outside. And then it's just got the little bar on the inside as we saw in the other picture of the interior there. Now, uh, as we were noting in the map, it is not all barracks out there. Uh, the barracks uh, made up most of the buildings in camp, you know, uh, uh, 400 plus buildings, but there were also other support buildings. Uh, there are the H-shaped buildings that were the latrines. Uh, you'll see those, those some of the time, although a lot of those got torn down and just used as salvage. And there were also the mess hall buildings that we were talking about earlier, which is sort of a large building with almost a domed roof on top of it right there. And so there are a few pieces of those floating around out there as well. Um, in addition to that, you've also got other support buildings. Um, I always bring this one up because uh, this is a, an easy one to spot. So this is the Hard Mountain High School uh, there. And this was by uh, all accounts, the nicest building within the camp. It wasn't there when the incarcerates first arrived but was built and was ready to go uh, by uh, the end of 1943 there. And so it was a fairly large building and it got split off into pieces after the war was over. Um, I believe uh, this auditorium that you see right here, the gym basically, uh, was uh, pick it up, picked up and moved. And I think it went down to Centennial if I'm correct and uh, formed the uh, gym in the old high school there. It was used up until about 2000 or so when it, when it fell in. Um, but uh, Pavilion, not Centennial, excuse me. Uh, but all that's remaining of the high school right now is the old records vault from it. And this sits out in uh, the uh, field uh, just off of uh, where we have our honor roll and our walking trail here. And you can see that it is just an old concrete building. Uh, so there's not much of it left. You probably would not know this was part of the camp unless uh, you had somebody to tell you there. But you can, if you notice, notice the five panel door right there, uh, which is a hint at it. So sometimes this is gonna take uh, not just identification out in the field, but also going around talking to locals and saying, hey, do you know where any of these are? Do you know where these buildings might be? And we're trying to do some of that information gathering for you volunteers. Uh, so we put feelers out there and we're collecting uh, permission forms from, from property owners as well. Uh, so a lot of times we'll have leads that we can send you out on, but if there's something that you think might be, um, you can always investigate it yourself and we'll get into how to do that a little later on. All right. So that sort of concludes a little bit about identification of barracks. Um, so I want to get into the part of this that uh, is not just about uh, IDing them, but about uh, um, documenting them as well and uh, performing these assessments and getting the photos that we've got here. And so we'll discuss that a little bit. Um, 
First off, though, I think it's important to sort of talk about how we go from, you know, IDN1 to the process of documenting it there. Like I say, we are attempting to do most of the legwork here at Heart Mountain for you, uh, in that we are hoping to get a good selection of barracks uh, and other buildings from Heart Mountain that people might have right there and uh, start collecting permission forms from property owners. However, we will make this a form available to you that I'm pulling up right now. Uh, this will go up on our website and I'll also email all participants here. Uh, this is something that we are sending out to property owners right now that just allows them to indicate their participation in the project. And so if you know somebody who does have a barrack who uh, you might be interested in recording it for, and you can see right here, we've got uh, just some basic information that we're collecting from them. Uh, this first question that you see is probably the most important question that we're looking at right here. And this is just giving permission to be included in the survey. Uh, so the first thing that we're trying to do is to basically develop the inventory as best we can. And that'll just be an internal document that is shared with us here at Heart Mountain, and then also with the Wyoming State Historic Preservation Office as well. And so if they say, you know, I'd love to include it, but I don't want it to be out there publicly, you know, you can assure them that if they just tick this box, yes, that it will be all private, that it'll be really limited in who it gets shared with there. And uh, uh, that's the important one that sort of allows volunteers to go out there. Uh, the other one that's, that we've got below this are for future ideas that we have planned. Um, first of all, uh, sharing photographs and descriptions on the website, and then granting permission for including the location of the buildings. And this is just the GPS coordinates and an online map. What we'd like to do eventually is to have an interactive map on our website to where uh, it will pull up all of the barracks that we've identified so far, at least the ones that the property owners have allowed us to use. And then when you clicked on those, you would be able to go through and you would be able to see some photographs of that building. You'd be able to get a description of that building. And so we're hoping a lot of people will participate in that. I think it'll be kind of exciting to watch that map fill up as we document more and more barracks there. And then uh, finally, the last question is, uh, I would be interested in posting a sign or plaque recognizing my barrack as a surviving structure from our mountain. This is something we're really excited about, but this is gonna have to be a future project. It's not included within our current grant. But eventually what we'd like to do is to encourage preservation of these buildings by making it something special, you know? Uh, our thought being that uh, if we can offer the people owning these buildings a plaque that says, you know, this is a historic Heart Mountain building, that that will encourage them to uh, make sure that it gets kept up, to uh, make sure that it's well taken care of. And it'll let people know that it uh, does have some history to it. Uh, so it'll be a nice conversation piece, if nothing else. And so uh, we're, we're excited about that and we're hoping to uh, be able to implement that in the future. Uh, so that's the basic thing that we would have you walk through with the property owners there. Obviously, um, as far as going from where you look at it and think, hey, that's a barrack to contacting the property owner, there's several ways you can do that. I'm going to have Larry fill us in a little bit about the Park County map server a little later on. Uh, but that's a great resource in finding out who might own a property there. Uh, but you also have other resources as well. You know, uh, of course, it's always good to ask around if anybody happens to know them there. And then, you know, as, as a final measure, I think that if you are a bold sort of person, there's nothing wrong with knocking on the door and asking uh, if that is indeed a barrack and if they would like to participate in the survey there. And that's why we'll make this permission form available to you. I just encourage everybody as they go out on assignments right now, also though, to uh, remember all the COVID-19 requirements and remember that, you know, you may have some older people living in these places. And so practice your social distancing, practice your mask wearing as you're going out and taking care of these things. And uh, just to generally be safe out there. Like I say, I, I'm not afraid to door knock, but I always use it as a last resort. I try and get an introduction from a friend or, or something like that first. And uh, if all of that fails, then I'll, then I'll just reach out and make contact myself. So once you have gotten to that part, 
um, you are going to want to uh, start filling out your assessment form when you have gotten permission from the property owner to head out there and do your work. Um, when you've scheduled the time to come and look at the barrack uh, that's convenient for them, you will want to start on this, the assessment form. And I filled out this assessment form for the barrack that's here at uh, the Hard Mountain Historic Site, the one that we have moved back from Shell. Uh, that you probably saw in the big picture as we were doing the introduction here. And so a lot of this information is really basic, just your name up at the top, the name of the property owner, that's just so we can tie it to the permission form right there. And you may have two or three barracks that a property owner has on the property. Uh, building address, this is just uh, the postal address of where it's at, but then because it might not be immediately visible or it might be further back on that address uh, than we can see. We also ask for just a basic location of it on the property. So uh, ours is pretty visible. And so I say as much, you know, it's visible from highway 14A, it's immediately Southeast of the main driveway into the interpretive center there. Uh, GPS coordinates, we'll talk a little bit about how to get these later on. Um, basically, you can pull them up with your phone if you stand at the southwest corner and take a picture and the information of that picture, you will get uh, the GPS coordinates. Um, you can also pull up uh, like Google Maps or any other map application on your phone and, and it will give you the GPS coordinates as well. Um, there's also a way to find them after the fact. Um, I'll have Larry show you that on the map server again. And then we have uh, the brief description of uh, where we are there. And so this is just talking about what you can notice about the building. So I did, just did a real basic one that says 10 windows on Northwest and Southeast sides of buildings, one window on Southwest end, three doors with wooden steps and landing on Southeast side, one door with wooden ramp and steps on Northeast end. Building has a black roof, EPDM per owner. You don't, if you can't identify the material, it's okay to just say, this is what I think it is, or this is what it looks like. Um, if you can talk to the owner and get a little more sense of it, uh, that's great. Black material that resembles original tar paper, again, Derby gum per owner on all exterior walls. Wooden battens along exterior walls, approximately 18 inches apart. Interior is unfinished, subdivided into two rooms, 60 by 120 or 60 by 20, that should be, that's a typo on my part. Southwest room is being subdivided. Uh, signatures on the inside, some dated to 1942. All of this is helpful evidence in saying, yes, this is definitely for sure a barrack. Uh, floor appears to be original and is showing those saw marks like Eric showed you in the, the earlier slide there. Uh, known history. So this is where once you've made contact with the property owner, you're really going to want to get as much information as you can from them. And so part of this is looking at the building itself and discussing it. And part of it is asking what they know about the building uh, and how it came to be there. And that may be nothing. They may know very little about it, but uh, they may know a lot about it. For instance, I know about this barrack that it was one or two that were sent to the city of Grable in 1945. City of Grable sold them to Iowa State University. I know that there was some extensive remodeling done to them then, and then we moved them back here in 2011, or in 2015, excuse me. I probably should have included that last part on here. I'll, I'll make sure to add that. And then additional evidence beyond anything that you've listed so far that identifies it as something coming from Heart Mountain. So here I put uh, the exterior windows and door placement and their sizes, doors are original shape and size, and then uh, amongst the graffiti and signatures on the inside of the building, we've got one that says a slap for the, uh, and, and then it has a racial slur following it right there, which definitely tells us that there's some tie to the camp there. Uh, you won't always find something that definite, but um, you know, for the most part, those uh, doors and windows will tell you. Um, the condition of this one is good. It's gone through restoration. You know, it is structurally sound. It's probably not going anywhere. If we go back to one that we were looking at, like uh, Takogawa was standing in front of in the slide beforehand, that one's in poor condition, right? Failure of structure was imminent, would require extensive repairs. And so we also offer you a fair that's kind of in an in-between uh, place there. And then notes on damage, you can note if it's rated fair, you can say, okay, well, you know, the building is pretty good, but there's a hole in the roof. 
Uh, you can note uh, if it's poor that, you know, all of it's failed, that it looks like it's about to fall down right there. Uh, but you can just note any damaged places or how extensive the damage is right down in here. And that would let us know later on if we identify some that are in fair condition uh, that aren't necessarily going to uh, be lost if we can save them. You know, maybe that way we can help out the landowner later on and come in and say, well, you know, we can patch this piece or, or we can work with you on this. Uh, you know, we don't currently have any plans for that, but it gives us some options in the future if we see some that we feel like uh, we could save and that the landowner is interested in saving, you know, we might be able to help them out with that. So always good to note that uh, and helps us identify which ones are, are probably too far gone to for any preservation in the future. And then last thing is just a short diagram of the building. I made a real simple one right here. Obviously, I'd love for you guys to make these as complex as you possibly can, but I did mine real rough just to show you that you don't have to be a great artist in order to make it happen. There. And so uh, it's just the important things are getting sort of the orientation of the building to north. So you're always going to want to mark north on there. And again, this is something you can pull up on your phone as a compass that'll tell you that. And then uh, showing you the length of the exterior walls, at least, that we have right there. And then I've shaded this whole thing in because this whole thing appears to be a building. But if only parts of the building are, are former Heart Mountain buildings, then you might shade in those different parts right there. And then I, finally, uh, the last thing was attaching photos of the building from all sides, being sure to identify which direction the building is facing in the file name for each photo. So this is something to remember is you're identifying the direction that the building is facing, not the way you are facing when you're taking a picture of the building, but the way the building is facing towards you. And then interior photos, if they're approved by the property owner right there. So I've just set up for our barrack out here, we've got the northeast in, northwest side, southeast side, southwest in. And in this one, the way it's oriented, it can be a little weird to uh, uh, try and figure out exactly how to go with it. Um, and so uh, the good thing is to just make sure that uh, these descriptions are consistent with the descriptions that are in the rest of your assessment form there. Um, and that will be helpful to us in determining where things are. And with that, I am actually going to bring up Larry Todd right now. Larry, if you wouldn't mind just starting your video. Ah, thanks so much. And Larry is on the Park County Historic Preservation Commission here. Um, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about some resources that are available to you digitally to help identify these buildings and then if there's anything I missed, Larry, feel free to jump in. And Eric, I may bring you up here in a little bit to talk about parts of ID I've missed you. All right, over to you, Larry. Okay, thank you, Dakota. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit or to kind of expand on what Dakota had been talking about is on the photos. Um, one of the things that I always find real handy on taking photos of things and trying to keep track of where they are is to include on your sketch map where you've taken each photograph. So if you're standing at one end of the uh, building and take a photo, mark that place on your sketch map and then move around to the other side, mark that place on your sketch map too. And that way, if you get back and you sort of are confused about what was Northwest or Southwest or Southeast, uh, when you're looking at the pictures, you've got your sketch map to help kind of tie that in. And also um, don't think that you just need to restrict yourself to taking those four cardinal direction photographs. If there are inter inter interesting features or some of the diagnostic features or any other things like that, um, go ahead and take the photos of that when you're in the field and, and looking at them and then keep a log of which one of those photos are so you can make a description of them when you get back. So the photos are, um, at this point with our phones and everything, just extremely easy to take, extremely easy to transport. And so I, I'd suggest taking more rather than fewer photos. So with that, um, what I wanna to talk to you about is that um, both Prentice and Eric showed you or told you some of the interesting stories and the layers of stories that are encapsulated in these buildings. And part of 
what um, the Heart Mountain Center is trying to do in capturing the information on where these buildings are is to tar start tying those stories onto the landscape and to really document how far the barracks have moved and the diversity of their usages and um, put that into a spatial framework. And that's why things like the address and the GPS locations and those sorts of, of data that Dakota was telling you about are extremely important. They allow us to put these physical evidences of the stories of past lives back onto the landscape and kind of tie the stories to place. And one of the ways, there's multiple ways, again, as Dakota um, suggested that you can do this with Google Maps or any, any of those sorts of things. But given that we're in Park County and Park County has a very nice online mapping system, I wanted to run you through some of the basics of using that online mapping system that the county provides to help both uh, identify the locations and then at the end of what I'm talking about, um, maybe help you explore uh, for additional barracks from the comfort of your own home looking at the aerial photos. So if you want to use the Park County uh, map page, if you're not familiar with it um, at present, you can just go to the, the general Park County um, web server. Next slide, please. Just hit enter. Go to the Park County web page at uh, www.parkcountyus uh, and then click on the online services link. Next. Uh, which is that button right there. So if you click on that button, it will take you to this page. And the online services include things where you can pay your tax there, uh, but also you can go to the, um, the map server, which is down there in the bottom, next. So click on that map server link, next. Right down there, next. And that'll take you to a page where you say you agree to all the terms of using the maps and you click yes on that. And then it'll go to a view that looks like this, which is just general, a general um, map of the Park County area. And there's lots of things you can click there. You can click the, the landowner and that'll come up. You can, you can identify whether you want the federal land on the maps, the public lands on the maps, or you can next, please click on, um, or you can move around too. So you can move that map to the area of interest. If you know that you're looking for a barracks that's just outside of Powell or in Powell, you can move that view that's centered on Cody over to the Powell area. Next. What I've done here is click down on the lower right-hand side, um, one of the layers, which is an aerial photograph of, or a series of aerial photos, that were taken in 2020 that are of the highest resolution yet. Uh, there are other photos at um, half meter and one meter and uh, several feet resolution uh, that cover more of the county. But this really high resolution um, 2020 photos that are shown here, if you can use those, go ahead and use those because they give you, you the, the best resolution on the maps you might be looking for. Next. Okay, go ahead, next. Okay, there's the, the different layers. So Dakota gave you the description of a barracks located on um, Hart Mountain. And this is the one of the views, sort of the first zooming in on the Hart Mountain facilities, next. So there's Hart Mountain, next. You can search on this too. You can enter, there's a search button up top. You can enter the name of the place. So this is um, coming in for a closer view of that barracks that um, Dakota has done the description of. And some of the other things you can do here next is once you've zoomed in on the interest to it, in, to the area of interest, next, you can do things like go up here and click on this uh, ruler and you can get a rough measurement of it to check out that 120 by 20 um, foot dimension to see if the building does fit those dimensions. 
And this one with this quick rough one I did there, the length comes out as 110, but given that I was probably drinking coffee and my mouse was shaking around as I was doing that, um, not necessarily the 120 feet, but it tells you you're in the ballpark. Um, next. Other things you can do is if you don't remember to get a GPS coordinate in the field or you're not comfortable with it, or if you want to check it, next. You can move your cursor on your computer to the point that you want to record a GPS reading, a locational reading. And while your cursor is at that point, next, you'll have either a UTM reading on the lower right hand of your screen, next, or the latitude, longitude of that point right where your cursor is um, at, at the screen. So if you didn't get the uh, location down in the field, uh, you can do it at your leisure at home. This also means that uh, Heart Mountain staff, if they've got a good location on the site, can come into the maps and refine the locational information later. So while the specific setting of the site, where it is on the landscape is extremely important, there's some redundancy, some multiple ways that we can get at that location. So the address will get us at the location eventually. Um, your phone data will get at it. If you have a handheld GPS um, that you use for hunting or hiking or things like that, uh, those data are useful. Or we can even do it from these, these online maps. Next. So those are the coordinates um, from this that uh, I got from looking at there. Um, next. Oh, the back, don't go next yet. Um, another thing you can do is up there on the top of the screen where that measurement bar is, there's a little information. It's the one that's um, highlighted up there. It's got the white around it, a little eye in a circle. If you click on that, the information that's on the right hand of the side of the screen will show up which tells you the address of the place, who owns it, how to get in uh, contact with them, um, some additional information on where it is and legal descriptions. It gives um, locations, um, in this case, lat lawns, but that, those aren't the specific locations of the building. That's the location of the property, the lot on which the building is set. So again, this is just another way that you can start getting information on your buildings. If you see a building that you think might be a barracks and uh, you can't contact the owner and nobody's there if you knock on the, on the door, you can go back home and find out who the owner might be by looking at these online maps. Next. Next. Okay, yesterday on Facebook, um, Heart Mountain um, had this barracks that's located in Powell is an example of what you might find when you're out looking around. So as a little sort of um, way to play with the online maps and explore for this building next, I started looking through the, the photos, the, the 2020 aerial photos of Powell, um, searching to see if I could find something that sort of looked like this. And sure enough, I found this building here on the right that is on 6th Street, Street, as they described the, the barracks in the, the Facebook post. It has the right dimensions. It has the multiple doors coming in. It looks like a winner. Next, if you hit the information tab on the online stuff, you'll see some interesting things about this building. It tells you that it was built in 1945 which may not be the exact year. There's a little asterisk there that they say that um, year of construction may not be exact, but it tells you the ballpark. Next, you'll also see that there's uh, tabs here for sketches and photographs. And so many of the buildings, especially in the towns, have drawings of the buildings and photographs of them. Next. So here's the sketch in the county web server for that building which if you'll recall the, the drawing of a barracks that Dakota showed you earlier, this is just boom, the cookie cutter, same dimensions, same layout, uh, that's sort of a dead giveaway. If you click on the, the photo uh, up there on the county, next, 
there's your 100% confirmation that the building that they'd showed is the one that is recorded in the county records. So this is a way that um, if you have some free time on your hands and the weather's bad and you wanna participate in searching for barracks and um, don't wanna be out wandering around in the countryside or can't be wandering out around on the countryside, uh, because it's snowing or cold or windy or the roads are muddy and you wanna just spend some time doing this space exploration for barracks and remember some of the characteristics that uh, Dakota and Eric talked about in terms of the dimensions and the L shapes and the, the, those sorts of things. Uh, you can potentially start locating potential barracks at home, um, at your computer, if there are other things that you don't need to. So for example, I kind of plan probably Tuesday evening when I want to shut down from listening to everything else to spend some more time going through um, the area, uh, searching for more of these buildings, seeing if I can find some more online. So there's multiple ways that you can try to find information and share information on these bearings, barracks with us. So thank you. That's about all I had to say. Okay. Thanks, Larry. And I definitely think one of the good takeaways from this is that there's not a lot of barriers to entry on this project, you know, um, however you want to do it is, is good to dive into it. There's ways that you can help out from home. There's ways that, you know, you can help out in the field there. If you're not feeling comfortable with the equipment, uh, there's nothing wrong with just recording as much as you possibly can. You know, if you, if you're a novice when it comes to GPS, whatever you can get on that assessment form, we can send somebody else out to, to figure it out later on. Uh, you know, I think we want uh, to make this as easy as possible for everybody. And, you know, our goal is to find as many leads as we possibly can right now. So I'm going to go ahead and pull everybody up now and let's uh, field some of the questions that we have out there. And also if there are other things that uh, did not get mentioned there, let me just grab Eric and print us here real quick. Could I just add some? Could I add something to the last point that uh, Larry was making about how you can do this from afar? We we did this from from Laramie one semester, and uh, a student used the maps that you were talking about and kind of aerial surveillance. And the very helpful sketches and photographs uh, section, uh, casting a skeptical eye to anything that claimed it was constructed in 1942 or <laughs> between 1940 and about 1946. Uh, that student <coughs> tens of barracks, barrack fragments uh, in, the, in the course of a, uh, a term paper. So God knows how long that took, but um, the paper itself identified several dozen. So they're out there and they're not it's kind of fun. It's like a video game in some ways. Uh -huh. Yeah, Eric, do you mind telling us just a little bit about the project that you are working on with the University of Wyoming and how this kind of expands on that? Uh, help me understand which project you're thinking of. <laughs> well, I know there have been multiple there. <laughs> uh, you know, sort of the project that you guys did on on trying to ID some of these barracks and, and eventually the, the exhibit at, at Right. It, uh, I, I started out, um, since I've been involved with the, the interpretive center since before there was an interpretive center, I've, I've been thinking about um, both the interpretation during World War II and then what happened afterwards. And my idea always has been to go out and what we said, bag a barrack, try to find out where they were, how they're used, uh, and if possible, you know, sort of find people who might have lived in that as a barrack during World War II and people who have used the barrack to the present day in, uh, in Park County. So that was like a, a utopian dream. I tried for several years to do this from, my own, from Laramie through courses in the American Studies program, and it was incredibly logistically difficult. And um, we got, we didn't get very far. So this project that you're, you're doing, Dakota, promises to be successful and, and, and really necessary because uh, you need people in the county who can go out and, and check these things. One thing that we tried to do was to talk to people who um, had 
barrack fragments on their property and ask them um, the history of the building, the history of their family, their consciousness of what came before their inhabitation there, et cetera, et cetera. Do some, do some folklore, uh, some interviewing. Um, and that was, that was successful, but it was very limited by the fact that most of the time we were trying to go to call middle of February and um, that had its own adventures. And then I would make the students get out of the car immediately when they got to Hard Mountain and walk around the car, no, no matter what the weather was, just to get a sense of what Prentice and his folks had to put up with. And, and usually they spent the next half day defrosting and, uh, you know, it's just impossible. So um, you'll get all kinds of moral support from us. And, and we have some experience in the various components. We have our own uh, forms for this that I'll be glad to send you, Dakota, to see if they match up with yours. They were devised by Mary Humstone, who is our historic preservation specialist. We do have some tapes of people that we interviewed, um, but it's been, I've been feeling guilty for about 10 years uh, at our inability to get this done. And this promises to be the way to get it done. So you're assuaging my Catholic guilt here. It's a very, very helpful thing. And to, to touch on a question you asked or answered in chat, Eric, just for the YouTube folks watching later, um, someone, Melissa, had asked if they told us about a barrack five or 10 years ago, or even if you come into the Interpretive Center, you know, a year ago and said, hey, I think I own a barrack, you know, should you reach out again? And the answer is absolutely go ahead and reach out again because we want to go ahead and get that form filled out. And, you know, if we looked at it five, 10 years ago, the condition could have changed a lot since that time. So we'll want to uh, send somebody out to redo it. But uh, we want to make sure and get things as formalized as possible. So even if you've reached out to us already and, and we may have already come out and take photos, reach out again. We'll, we'll uh, send someone out again. Uh, we appreciate that there. And uh, yeah, if you were involved with the, the University of Wyoming project, go ahead, contact us again for sure. Um, so just a few other questions right there. Larry, this might be one for you. Uh, Thomas had asked, um, are there USGS survey maps uh, for this area that might be of help in conjunction with the local county maps? Yeah, there definitely are. The USGS maps have a lot of the structures on them. And if you don't have a paper copy of the map, you can click on the USGS map layer on that county web page where I was using the aerial photos and bounce between the two. Um, often, you know, when there's... Um, different sorts of information you can get from each. So yeah, the, a lot of the structures are on the USGS maps, but one of the downsides of that is many of those are at a one to 2400 scale. Uh, and the zooming in on individual structures is sometimes uh, a bit hard. And so I, I would definitely recommend uh, bouncing between the two. Use the USGS map, maybe to get to the general location and then switch to the highest resolution error photo you have of the area and bounce between them. Excellent. And Nicole had also thrown out there, and, and Eric, I know you touched on this a little bit and, and I'll ask you two out loud and then I will a little bit too. Nicole had asked if there was the possibility of you know this kind of workshop and this kind of work being useful to some of the other uh, incarceration sites around the country there? Yeah, uh, and the answer is definitely yes, at least from my perspective, especially with uh, Tule Lake and Minidoka, which were also a Bureau of Reclamation sites. Um, so the, the, the barracks were more inclined to be used after the war than cannibalized or even burned, excuse me. And there are some good books out there on that. If you're into photography, there's a um, Manzanar, it was the largest camp and also had a, a town near it. So uh, a lot of the barracks there were dragged into town and used for some, for other things. And there's, there's a book that documents that that's really interesting. And then photographers have gone through um, contemporary Thule Lake and interviewed or taken pictures of people who own present day barracks and they're, they're tremendously interesting photographs and stories. So there's a lot that we can base our, um, the next step on, you know, here. 
All right, thanks, Eric. And uh, yeah, I think that that's uh, something that's very true is that in most cases, you know, these, these buildings were reused. Um, you gotta remember post-war, especially these homesteaders, we're looking for any kind of leg up that they could possibly get, you know, and uh, as I think Eric may have touched on before, one of the reasons that these barracks were popular is it was a quick way to satisfy your condition of improving your land, right? Uh, and so uh, even if you had to, usually the government would give them away or for or sell them for kind of the token dollar, right? And then uh, you would have to pay somebody to haul them away uh, off to your property. But once you got them fixed up a little bit, they could be your improvement. And so the reason why Heart Mountain has so many is uh, that the transition between the camp being here to the homestead period was so very quick here, uh, but it definitely happened in other places and these buildings were put to use. Um, I always talk about the fact that uh, some of the buildings here that we have at Heart Mountain, you know, we've talked a lot today about the buildings that were newly constructed for Heart Mountain, but they also scavenged buildings from the old CCC camps from the 1930s in order to build Heart Mountain. And so some pieces that you have around here are actually even older than, than the camp itself. And, and this, this uh, I mean, people in Wyoming, I think, are, are used to reusing things. There's no such, that everything is uh, inventory. Um, and so old buildings are inventory and they end up looking a lot like single wides or double wides or the, the kinds of buildings that you would move in if you were starting to live somewhere. In fact, if you go out looking around uh, for barracks, the thing that might deceive you a little bit uh, look, would be a single wide trailer that looks very much like a barrack fragment, except that the dimensions aren't exactly right. But the, the way that you live in it is, is exactly the same. And some of them sometimes are side by side, which is really interesting. And the last question we had was just a little bit about the scope of this project and how long we're going to be running it for. So uh, this is sort of our kickoff right now that we're doing with this workshop here. Um, we, we, of course, had hoped to do it live and in person, but uh, um, the COVID sort of got in the way of that. Um, we're hoping to pick up with another workshop in the spring after we've got the uh, group of you that are out here out and working. We're gonna try and recruit some more volunteers and maybe even uh, be able to do a live session, fingers crossed, where we could go out and look at some buildings and work through this process with some of you volunteers. And then uh, we are going to be collecting and working on this phase of the project up through September. Um, beyond that, you know, that's, that's when this current grant ends, but I, we'd really like to continue it beyond that as well and uh, keep going. I mentioned the plaques is something we wanna reach for in the future. Uh, likewise, we wanna reach outside of Park County too in the future. I know that there are some barracks up in Lovell and some barracks down in Warland and in Riverton even uh, that are still standing down there. And so we wanna try and reach out and capture those as well. So uh, the near term is, is we're working on this until next September, but in long term, we hope to be working on this for, for quite a while until we've gotten as complete as we possibly can a picture of what's out there. All right, I think that covers most of the questions. So I wanna thank everybody out in the audience for attending today. I wanna to thank all of our panelists, uh, Prentice, uh, Eric, Larry, uh, for joining me today and for getting started on this. And uh, please feel free to reach out to us uh, here at Heart Mountain if you've got any questions about how to go about this work or are interested in volunteering or even if you just know about a barrack that's out there, we're, we're happy to help you get started on this project. And uh, thanks so much for attending today. Have a great day.